What's up everyone, it's Endymion and I got a bunch of things I want to go over today. From entire government unions being gaslighted into combating what they believe is extremism in video games, a consulting group demanding the erasure of anyone who doesn't fit their agenda, the originator of the whole sweet baby discourse doubling down despite a losing battle, and that whole messy situation surrounding Asmongold and the Dragon's Dogma 2 nonsense. First, let's start with the Anti-Defamation League, or ADL for short. This story originates from this post they had that's making the rounds on Twitter where they say, As digital social spaces, online games should be regulated to address hate and extremism. It's vital for Congress to examine extremist radicalization in these spaces. Of course, this article and this entire discourse has coincidentally been brought to light surrounding the emergence of what these organizations are deeming Gamergate 2 as well as due to the whole presidential elections coming up this year in America. And we all know whenever there's a presidential election, the debates and hot takes from both sides get demon core levels of nuclear. So naturally, whenever big events like these go down, these sorts of organizations emerge out of the shadows to use their power to get more constraints on ordinary people. What the ADL is proposing here is that video games across the board from forums, in-game chats, and more need to be regulated far more heavily than they already are. And now with the whole Sweet Baby disaster unfolding, according to the ADL, this is somehow our fault. And therefore, because of Gamergate 2 essentially becoming a thing these past few weeks, this is proof alone that the average player of video games is now a bad person and you are all to varying degrees being radicalized by movements like these. And I guess to further lend a hand in what these sorts of organizations are saying, People like myself could be seen as problematic because since I actually report on these sorts of stories that I am somehow radicalizing those who watch. It's a load of nonsense, of course. I mean, the post on Twitter even has a community notes attached to it which says, There is little to no evidence that people are being radicalized through online gaming. This is simply a push for further surveillance of the public disguised as a goodwill gesture to combat extremism. People primarily play video games to simply relax and have fun. And that's really what it is. I don't consider anyone watching this to somehow be a radical individual in any way. It harkens back to that Kotaku article that attempted to infiltrate, as they put it, into the Discord servers that players were talking in. And like I said then, it was hilarious because the Discord server was public and everyone this Kotaku writer spoke to knew that they worked for Kotaku. It's incredible that Kotaku attempted to act like they were sending one of their journalists into some war-torn country amidst a civil war or something. When in reality, they just clicked a button on their computer and a bunch of regular gamers were like, Hi, welcome to our Discord, we just discussed games here. And Kotaku thought they were behind enemy lines or something. Truly incredible stuff. But that's what these journals and publications like this do. They gaslight and attempt to make things look far worse than they actually are. The whole Gamergate 2 situation was coined by their side and they are attempting to use it to gain more power in the future. There was this post from Vara Dark who also reports on these things. Check her out if you like, she does good work. But here's a post from her Twitter and it kind of got me thinking a little. In her post, she theorizes how everything that's happened in regards to Gamergate 2 has coincidentally lined up with the closure of Feminist Frequency and the upcoming GDC, or Game Developer Conference Talks. Which in case you don't know, GDC is where tons of devs from across the industry come together to network and do big speeches to teach other devs about certain topics. It's basically a big conference where they learn and connect. I personally think that GDC is a good thing for the industry. But of course, during GDC, you'll also have bad actors like Anita Sarkeesian in the past or Kim Belair who've also had their own GDC summits. And they got to spread their feminist poison onto the faces of everyone that was watching. Anyway, what Vera Dark theorizes here is that this entire situation is being manipulated by places like Sweet Baby and others. Not in order to destroy themselves, but to effectively create a fabricated situation where they can use what's happening as leverage and prove that because of the nuclear reception to their existence and what they do is not only good but mandatory for the future of video games. And they can use their victim mindsets which are protected by government funded organizations such as Take This, which is that branch organization ran by Homeland Security or the ADL themselves and then paint their company as victims. This then would reignite a new initiative across the entire industry in order to gain support for what they do. 
They push for diversity in games, then they ruin projects like Suicide Squad and more, players find out they exist, a tool is made to curate them, they then play the victim, rally their allies to run hit pieces like Kotaku, this then makes the entire industry speak out against this perceived lack of diversity in video games. And in doing so, Sweet Baby and others like them are then seen as victims of this entire thing, which in a sense radicalizes studios and people who want to virtue signal harder to implement more DEI practices into their games. And who gains from these services ultimately, but of course Sweet Baby and others like them. Essentially, it's a situation they're attempting to manipulate in order to paint a picture saying there's this huge problem and then offering their services as the solution to said issue. So what Vera Dark is explaining here in a way is that what's happening with Gamergate 2 and all of that could inadvertently be making Sweet Baby even stronger than it ever was. And due to the backlash, they would have everyone in their industry defending them even harder. So you may be thinking, does that mean all of this is meaningless? No, I don't think so. I believe the wake of controversies and exposures is nothing but a good thing for the paying customer. Because, sure, in the short run, this could lead to consulting groups like a sweet baby or whatnot getting more work, but as I've explained in previous videos like this, the push has been largely supplied by ESG funds. And those ESG funds were being pushed so heavily because they were the cheapest option for studios at the time, which is why you have so many low-quality games like Suicide Squad, The Saints Row Remake, and others being written and created by people who aren't really qualified for the jobs that they're doing. And eventually, those funds can and will run out, and despite these companies thinking they will win in the long run, the truth is simply that the industry needs the support of the public more than the public needs them. And they can attempt to strong-arm things like Sweet Baby into their games and force players into accepting it, but the reality they're hoping is that you're too stupid to realize that you don't have to buy anything they're making to begin with. So if a dozen studios think they will support places like Sweet Baby, Bare Knuckle, or Black Girl Gamers, they can do that. It's within their right as studios and publishers to do that, but they don't control you no matter how they try to word it. And they're hoping that you don't realize that you actually do have free will and you don't have to buy what they're selling. Which is why I think ultimately this entire pity party that I'm sure will commence once GDC kicks off officially soon will all be for nothing. Sure, in the short term, as in the next few years, we'll definitely have more AAA games with consulting groups attached to them. But it's like they say, once the genie is out of the bottle, that's it. There's no going back. And I think players in general like yourself who's watching this, you're more aware than ever before. And because of this, you will likely now be looking at every single massive Western release in the future, and you'll be looking for signs of pandering and nonsense like it. And this will, of course, lead to these consulting groups attempting to hide their influence. But if the internet is good at anything, it's that the internet is amazing at finding things out. And they can attempt to push everyone into their way of thinking, but the beautiful truth is that whether these woke weirdos want to admit it or not, their industry runs on capitalism and funds. And if nobody is buying your product, then whatever you're doing will be forced into not being repeated. So I will say this as both a player and someone who reports on stuff to any game dev studio head or someone working in publishing who's watching this, heed my words carefully. You have a few paths in front of you right now. You can either continue down this moronic crusade and believe players will have no choice, or you can abandon the bloated weight of these consulting groups and make products that don't alienate your audience and keep your studio and your job in the future. Remember that without the audience, you're nothing. A multiplayer game is useless if there are no players willing to engage with your product. Look at the failures already littered across, and I want these studios to realize that we don't work for you. You work for us, and if you attack and belittle us, just remember that we don't have to save you. And I guarantee there's enough of you watching this already who have enough of a backlog that if nothing new came out for a solid year, you'd still have something to play like I do. So it's really up to these studios if they want to double down like this, or accept that if they go down this route, they're going to become the next volition or worse. And as for the ADL attempting to say that players are radicalized, please, violent video games do not cause people to be violent. Video games give people escapism and help people come to terms with dealing with their emotions in a safe environment. Any idiot out there that attempts to gaslight you into believing that some video game is why a mass shooting happened or something is just moronic. Don't focus on the games and maybe focus on the fact that your school systems are designed to beat any originality or hope out of every single student that walks through your doors. 
and how society is designed to make everyone feel worthless and like another number on a spreadsheet instead of being a human being. Stop treating players in games as just quotas and realize that the weird leftist ideologies you're conditioned to as you drink your soy latte do not accurately represent or reflect what the majority of the world thinks. Just stop being dumbasses and keep politics out of video games. If you can do that, then you're golden. But some people are mad about these sorts of things, like another consulting group which is called Black Girl Gamers. From that parkplace.com, we have this article titled, For Spoken Consultant, Black Girl Gamers Appears to Discriminate in Their Hiring Practices While Claiming They Are Being Harassed. If you need to look at how identity and pandering is ruining games and other forms of media, look no further than Black Girl Gamers. It's a consulting group like Sweet Baby whose entire existence is about black women and their identity in media. They even recently wanted to hire people for upcoming projects. Guess the qualifications for that job. Was it a bachelor's degree, experience in video games, or maybe having an impressive portfolio? Nope. All that matters, according to them, is looking for black women content creators that make Dungeons & Dragons content for some potential brand work. Hit us up. That's it. That's all that matters to them. Your credentials don't matter, only the color of your skin and your gender. And then you wonder why so much media is in the absolute pits of despair right now. I have a particular bone to pick with Black Girl Gamers because they ruined Forspoken and inadvertently led to the closure of Luminous Productions, which was responsible for developing Final Fantasy XV as well. Their work on Forspoken led to one of the most insufferable and unlikable main characters in recent history. According to their own website, Black Girl Gamers were hired to consult Forspoken to provide insight on narrative and feedback on a pre-release build of the game that spanned from the gameplay experience to the portrayal of Frey as a protagonist of black descent including topics such as colorism and texturism. This was an important consultation given that Frey is one of the first female protagonists of black descent in the fantasy game genre. And yet, they fumbled it so badly they closed the studio and that game sold like garbage. Yet even then, as I previously showed, they're apparently getting deals regardless with places like Dungeons & Dragons anyways. It's as if your performance and actual ability to create surefire hits doesn't matter in this industry and all that really matters is your identity or what's between your legs. It's no wonder everything is so backwards. So many companies are bleeding money, but they don't lose sleep, I guess, because they think, well, we lost millions, but at least we're not racist, I guess. The fact they confidently explain their services on their own website as... Black Girl Gamers is uniquely placed in the gaming industry. The intersection of our team, community, and experience allow us to offer a number of consulting services for clients within gaming and TV film industries. Our services range from aiding studios and developers in their game character development, consulting on go-to-market strategies, DEI recruiting strategies, influencer marketing strategies, and more. So what they offer is a waste of resources pretty much, and they promise if you want your game to implode like Forspoken did, you should pay this group for their services. Why you would hire a group to consult on your game when they fumbled such a major release like Forspoken is beyond me. The founder of BGG is J.N. Lopez, and they were interviewed in 2023 by Game Rant about how the work BGG does is so important to the industry. One of the questions Game Rant asked was, were there any video games that made you wish that their character was a woman of color or a black woman? To which Lopez said, and I quote, I would flip the whole premise of a number of games, especially the ones that go into countries and get their relics. I would flip that on their head. That's always been a dream of mine in general, but to be honest, no, I'm not averse to having white characters. I'm just annoyed at how prevalent they are. I wouldn't want to change an existing character that I can think of at the moment. One of my favorite games, The Witcher 3, is predominantly based on a Polish novel. I have seen no need for me to change that main character. What I want is more stories that are authentic to black, brown, and non-white people of color to be reflected in. I don't want to necessarily have to race bend an existing character for me. That's not the epitome of representation. It works in some ways and other ways. I want some original content. I see diverse, underrepresented characters in games like Apex who have kind of covered a lot of bases. There are also games like Overwatch, which I had initially had a problem with, and they seem to be picking up their slack now. But still as a game that has a majority of white characters, I still don't understand how you can call yourself a diverse game and have a majority of white characters, but a lot of them that do it right are games where you can pick from a roster. And to quickly interject here, Lopez was then asked, has there been any video games that you've seen that have gone in the right direction in terms of diversity? To which she said again, and I quote, 
Apex Legends is definitely one that's done quite well. The intention is there and the same with Overwatch. Overwatch didn't have a black female character for so long and they had six white characters that were male. Seven white characters that were female and I was like, where's the black women? Out of the two, I would pick Apex because obviously they represent me and that's where I'm here for really and truly. Deathloop was also great and Ghost of Tsushima. I'm not Japanese so I cannot speak to the cultural accuracy but I really enjoyed that game." End quote. It's amazing how she doesn't seem to enjoy games unless she sees herself in them and has a tendency to look at rosters like Overwatch or Apex and count how many characters can fit her ideology instead of just picking a character that is fun to play. And it's also funny that she proves the point of Gamergate 2 where she admits that Witcher 3 is one of her favorite games. When there's not a single black person in the entire game. That's not racist by the way, since The Witcher is obviously based on a Polish novel and features Polish looking people. But Lopez owns herself that her entire crusade and nonsensical identity pushing means nothing since she clearly could enjoy a video game without having it bend to her every whim. And that's the point myself and others try to tell these people who work in the industry. You reach more people, like in Witcher 3's case, by not pandering but by simply telling a wonderful story with interesting characters. Why is this so hard to understand? The Witcher 3 would not be better if Ciri was suddenly a black woman or something. And I just find it amazing that the founder of this freaking consulting group admits it like this. Maybe if she took what she loved about Witcher, she could have applied that to Forspoken and maybe Luminous wouldn't have shut down last year. But instead we got an annoying caricature of a black character. I mean, it didn't dawn on black girl gamers that they consulted on a video game with a black protagonist and the end result was a young black woman who gets arrested for petty crimes, has no father figure in her life, and has to resort to crime to survive? Like, really, that's what you call a good representation of black women. When I was playing for Spoken, which I platinumed by the way, and I got to the part where Frey is like, yeah, I didn't know my dad? I thought the Japanese devs were just culturally out of touch, like come on guys, you made your black character not have a father figure? Then imagine my facepalm when I realized that a whole squad of black women consulted on this game saw that stereotypical part of her character and went, yeah, this is fine. At least give her a father and he just keeps the info that her mom is a sorceress or something to protect her. But instead you made her an abandoned baby in a station named after the place that she was found in, like come on dude. How were people paid to consult on something like this and with a straight face they advertise their work on this as some big hip hip hooray moment? That would be like me consulting on a game and pushing the devs to make the main character's dad a war criminal cause I'm Serbian. And all Eastern European people in media are always traffickers or war criminals of some kind. Like come on dude, you say you want to do better but this is just not it at all. Then you have this other article from that park place titled Sweet Baby Inc. employee Chris Kindred doubles down on call to cancel Steam curator list and labels members as Nazis. Yes, the same person who started this fiasco has decided to double down on their moronic ideas. Kindred, who was the original person from Sweet Baby that attempted to ban Cabrutus for their curator tool, is saying that anyone who talks against their employer is just writing fanfiction at this point. And that the group should still be taken down despite everything that's happened if not for the conspiracies which have been proven time and again to be true then because they are apparently Nazis. On what basis does Kindred say this? Who exactly is like this? Of course there's no examples whatsoever. And Kindred's account is now protected because that's what these people always do. It's the classic everyone who disagrees with me is bad and should be thrown in jail. Very cool. Maybe instead of just throwing out terms like Kindred should actually talk to some of these people. Try to find a common understanding, but we know it won't happen, because then they can't handle their views being dismantled for all the world to see like that. And it's far easier to yell stuff than hide, it's just so sad and pathetic. Speaking of hiding, as I was making this, Cabrutus Rambo, the guy who made the Steam Curator tool that Kindred called out and, you know, started all this, brought this to my attention. He noticed that there has been some suspicious scrubbing of names and affiliates when it comes to the whole extremism and gaming thing. And if you click on the link that was provided, it says that error, nothing is available all of a sudden. In case you're wondering what this is, EGRN, which stands for Extremism Gaming Research Network, and if you use the link that Cabrutus provided, by the way, I'll link his post in the description in case you want to look yourselves. But anyway, in the archived version we can see this site originally said this, meet our members. Our individual membership includes qualified individual researchers, practitioners, public servants, and more listed below who actively engage in EGRN outputs and activities. 
And it goes further by saying, members of the EGRN are researchers, practitioners, and public private sector service providers with a vested interest in understanding the links between gaming, adjacent platforms, and radicalization extremism and preventing countering violent extremism. If you're interested in learning more about the network and our work, please look through the pages here and use the contact form at the bottom of the page to get in touch with us. Then, of course, as you scroll, you'll have the names of people involved with this, but now on their public site, it is, of course, scrubbed completely, which is interesting. I don't think this means that they're ceasing operations or anything. Likely, it's being done to simply mask their trail and who's involved, if anything. There is far too much interest in this whole Gamergate 2 situation on both sides of the aisle for them to stop suddenly. Likely, they'll work in secret, but this, along with the ADL nonsense I talked about in the beginning of the video, it's definitely all connected, my friends. The gaming industry at large is refusing to admit that they're in the wrong and they are backpedaling, deleting, and will absolutely gaslight you into believing that everything that you are accusing them of has never happened. It's the same tactic that they always use. That Park Place used this book called SJWs Always Lie in one of the articles I was talking about. And it's author, Vox Day, who said this when it comes to the tactics of social justice warriors. Vox said, instead of coming clean in one way or another, the SJW will instead double down and attempt to shore up his lies by concocting an even larger framework of deceit and misdirection to support them. He will throw the full weight of his status and credibility into the efforts, call on the support of his entire social network, and try to turn the risk of potential exposure into a popularity contest between him and the individual threatening to expose him. The goal is to destroy the whistleblower's credibility so that even if the truth comes out, no one will believe it. And what we're seeing right now with the ADL, EGRN, Black Girl Gamers, or Sweet Babies, Chris Kindred, this all rings true. Once they get exposed as being wrong, everything they've done is scrubbed and they will use their influence to gaslight you into believing that you're crazy. And even if the truth is revealed, it's then masked and contorted due to the ever-growing falsehoods that they keep presenting. So this is not just a battle of video games, it's a battle of misinformation. And that's why I say that we need to keep these people accountable. And then there's just another story with Asmongold and the Dragon's Dogma 2 debacle that is also nonsense as well. Since Asmongold has obviously been speaking on Sweet Baby, and recently he was announced to be a part of Dragon's Dogma 2's marketing campaign with his own official pawn within the game. And of course, like always, because someone who doesn't agree with the game's industry on everything, he's being attacked. And this is what I've been saying. You either play ball to a T in every way imaginable, or you get blasted like this. You'll find tons of SJWs on Twitter crying saying that they're going to not buy the game because of Asmongold's involvement. But let's be real, this is stupid of them to even try. His reach is too great, and his presence in gaming, whether they want to admit it or not, is something that will likely not change for a very long time. And this is simply because Asmongold is not parroting their politics or ideologies to a T. If he was a super liberal guy, they would be shouting from the rooftops that he's involved. But he disagrees with them, so oh no, now he's suddenly bad and should be cancelled. This is like the 40th time Asmongold has been cancelled, so clearly like previous cancellations, none of these seem to work. And all it's going to do is make the Streisand effect happen again like it did with Kerbrutus and Sweet Baby. So if a bunch of communist SJWs threaten to not buy your game, I think that's fine. Because they don't have money anyway, so catering to those people is a bad financial decision to begin with. But as you can see from all the things I talked about today, this situation is evolving in really interesting ways. They're attempting to gaslight, ruin, and change the narrative to fit their agenda, but don't worry fellas, because me and others will keep them accountable. And I'll like always keep my ear to the ground to ensure if any rumblings happen, I'll be sure to let you all know. As always, thank you for watching. Like, subscribe, and share if you enjoyed it. Thanks to my patrons as well. Have a wonderful day, take care of yourselves, and I'll see you in the next one.